So maybe I can start by maybe answering partially the last question about Ukraine. Uh, indeed, uh, we are looking mainly at Africa. And when we launched the project, that's really the region we wanted to address because that's where the majority of the HIV patients are. And that's where there is absolutely no data available on resistance. But one of the ideas we have is indeed to look into Eastern Europe, and Ukraine is in Eastern Europe, where there is a kind of a more recent epidemic than in West Europe, although the virus has been present for quite some time, but hasn't been reported as heavily as uh, was done in the Western or so-called developed world. And to look into Ukraine and other countries and to see what happened there and maybe use that to model and predict what is going to happen in Africa. Because we know resistance is going to happen. It happened when we started treating patients in the Western world, and it's already there in Africa. We know it's there, and we just want to know how bad it is, or hopefully not too bad, but I have worked with the HIV virus for over 10 year, uh, 30 years, and I know what that virus is capable of in terms of resistance. So that's what I want to share with you tonight, is to go a bit more into the virology of the virus and see what is our enemy. And so, first a recap, very basic. AIDS stands for the Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, which is the result of an infection by HIV, the human, human immunodeficiency virus. And AIDS, the status of AIDS is characterized by opportunistic infections and cancers that are not seen in healthy people. And if untreated, is fatal. HIV is a retrovirus. That means that's a virus which integrates its genetic material into the genetic material of the infected individual. And that means that you cannot get rid of the virus. Because if a cell genetic material contains the virus genetic material, when it duplicates, you get two cells with that genetic material and you cannot get rid of the virus. So the virus resides in what is called CD4 cells, which are key to the good functioning of the immune system. And that what is, what's, is happening when you get AIDS is that actually HIV destroys your immune system. And HIV is transmitted by blood and sexual intercourse is not transmitted by mosquitoes, like some people might believe. This is not the case. Just a few basic facts to remember. So if we would say that this is a human being in a test tube, okay? This, what is represented here, is actually this person's blood with, in blue, the famous CD4 cells. And you see that there are many CD4 cells. Now, the infection takes place, and within weeks to months, we can see that the number of CD4 cells have decreased, and that the virus is heavily and happily replicating. Over the course of time, the virus is going to destroy those CD4 cells wherever they are in the body. And if it's not treated, we will end up with AIDS, where there are almost no CD4 cells anymore, and where the patient will die from the opportunistic infections and the cancer. So, hopefully, there is treatment. And the treatment has transformed this acute disease into a chronic disease. What is the purpose of the treatment is to control the virus replication. If the virus cannot replicate, it will not kill the CD4 cells and the immune system will remain more or less healthy. 
So that's really the aim. So we want to keep the virus under control to prevent further damage to the immune system and also, very importantly, to prevent transmission. How do we get there? We get there by using three different anti-HIV drugs. A combination of drugs which will bring the levels of the virus in the blood to what we call undetectability. And there are tests, viral load tests, which can measure the number of virus particles in the blood. And by using three different anti-HIV drugs with different mechanisms of action, we can prevent the appearance of resistance. But very importantly, if we want to succeed to control the virus, the patient has to take the medication every day for the rest of his or her life. And you can already see that that is going to be a problem. I'll come back on that. So this is a bit of virology. This is a replication cycle of the virus. I won't go into the details, but just to show that in the course of the years, there have been inhibitors of this replication that have been identified at different steps in the replication cycle of the virus. And it's by combining drugs from those different classes of inhibitors that we can prevent resistance to occur. If we use only one drug, the virus will be initially inhibited, but then will come back and will be resistant. So we've been very, very, very active on finding new drugs. This is the drugs that have been approved by the European Medicine Agency. So those are the drugs that are available in Europe and are essentially the same in the US. Uh, and you can see that there are very different, many different classes. And that in the course of time, we have started with monotherapy and that has led to resistance. Adding new classes of drugs has allowed to do this famous combination therapy. And now what is happening is that people work mostly on treatment simplification. So that patients, instead of having to take two handful of pills every day, can now take one pill once a day. So this, has what this is what has happened in the so-called developed world. If we look at the limited, uh, at the low and middle income countries, the treatment options are far less. They are divided essentially in a first line, which represents about 90% of the treated patients. A second line, which represents maybe 10% of the treated patients, and a third line, which is anecdotically present in some countries. Why is that? Well, for the first line, it's a single fixed dose combination, a single tablet of, one cla of two classes of three drugs. This combination is to be taken once a day, so it's very easy, one pill once a day. But it has a low genetic barrier to resistance. So if you miss a few intakes, for whatever reason, you might get resistance. The second line is another class of drug, plus two of this class, but there there are no single tablet regimens. So you have already to take multiple tablets and they come from different manufacturers. And those pills, a treatment costs three to five times the cost of a first line regimen. If we go to the third line, we try to find things that can be combined because in the meantime, the virus has become resistant to this, to this, to this. So we try to find something which still works. And the cost is for many countries just prohibitive. So what we see in Africa is that in the treatment guidelines, they make provision for first line 
for second line to some extent, and some countries just say third line, forget about it. We can't afford it. So essentially, if you compare this with the luxury we have here, to be able, if a patient doesn't tolerate a certain regimen, we can put him on another regimen. Here, no, no choice. You take it or leave it. And we know that those drugs have side effects, which will lead also to probably adherence uh, problems. So this is exactly the, sh the, the vicious circle we are in. If we have poor adherence, we're going to get a treatment failure, which will be measured by a detectable plasma viral load. So we will be able to detect the virus in the blood. That will lead to drug-resistant viruses, that will limit the treatment options, require the use of more cumbersome treatment, and we go back into poor adherence. If already taking one pill once a day was too difficult, it's going to be way more difficult if I have to take two or three or five pills, and maybe twice a day. So that's the problem that we encounter. So how just a f a f couple of slides on virology. So here to depict, you have the virus population in an HIV-infected patient who has never been treated. We apply drug pressure and the viral load over time decreases to remain undetectable. But you can see that here in this population there are already a few viruses which are drug resistant. And that's why we need absolutely to use three different drugs. Because the virus might be resistant to one of the, two dr the three drugs, and so the two others will maintain that virus under control. Yes? Is the reason why the virus has already some drug resistance, is that because the person who they contracted the virus from had drug resistance? Or does it nat naturally occur? The drug resistance does occur naturally because the virus is a very sloppy virus. When it makes copies of, of itself, it makes mistakes. And so it makes the mutations which can render it resistant to a drug. But if you use three drugs, those viruses will not be able to emerge. But the virus, the resistant viruses are just looming around the corner, and if you release the drug pressure, the viral load is going to increase again and you're going to enrich the virus population into resistant variants. And that's where you get the problem. But it's really because of low adherence that risk resistance is not that the patient that takes it every day could build resistance. Um, you, you can, if the patient is taking the drugs every day and is completely fully compliant, then we know that the virus will be kept under control. And that, will and that can remain for years and years and years. Okay. And even if, if this patient who is now drug resistant, right, if they have sex with, the, with someone else, and that patient gets the, the red virus, so the resistant one, yeah. if they take medication, uh, well, it all depends. It all depends on which medication they are going to get, and that's the and that, yeah, and that's that's just to show you the variability of the virus. This is just one small part of the virus, and every color dot represents a mutation. And this comes from clinical isolates, and this shows just that you can have billions of variants which are all different viruses with different mutations who can cause AIDS. So how is the monitoring, and I will come back on your question, how is the monitoring done in uh, low- and middle-income countries according to the WHO recommendations? When a patient is tested HIV positive and it is decided to start treatment, the patient is put on the first line that I described earlier. The viral load is not measured at that point in time and there is no resistance testing done because resistance testing is not done. It's just unaffordable. 
So the patient is put on first line and six months later, a viral load is measured. If the viral load is below a certain threshold, it's a, tre it's a threshold which is higher than the threshold we use in our countries, but virologically it's still very relevant. If the viral load is below that threshold, the patient is continued on first line and comes back one year later to get another viral load done. If the viral load is above that threshold, the patient goes into a course of adherence counseling. And six to eight weeks, well, mostly three months later, a new viral load is done. If by that time the viral load has gone to below the threshold, then the patient continues on first line. If the viral load remains above that threshold, the patient should be switched on second line. Just to explain the difference with what we do here, when a patient is started on a first-line therapy, we do a viral load and we do a resistance testing, just to be sure that the, virus, the, the, the patient has not been infected with a uh, resistant virus. And we measure the viral load three months later. So we know from the baseline viral load and the one we have at three months and then at six months whether the viral load is going down or not. Here, it's just a bit of a guess. If the viral load is still there, is it because the patient is just still going down? We don't know, okay? And the patient is monitored, at least in the beginning, every three to four months. And as soon as something happens, viral load is repeated within three, four weeks, and the resistance testing is done. So we monitor here the patients very closely just to avoid this resistance to occur. Here we can't because there are no means to do it. And so, as you just said, what are the consequences of not monitoring properly the viral load? We have a series here of patients who are HIV infected. They are put on first line treatment and in the majority of the cases those patients get an undetectable viral load, so they are doing well, they can keep on first line. And most importantly, this pregnant woman gives birth to a child which is not infected. Unfortunately, a certain proportion of those patients do develop resistance, and those are going to infect other people with resistant virus, and a pregnant woman will give birth to a child that might be infected with resistant virus. But now, when those patients are diagnosed with HIV, they are going to be put on first line. But we know that this first line is not going to work. But you can't know because no resistance testing has been done. So those patients are going to be kept at least six months on a treatment which doesn't work. And the virus is going to build up resistance so that even when eventually one notices that there is resistance, that the treatment is not working, the virus has become so resistant that it might be difficult for the second line to work properly. So this is really the importance of avoiding resistance. And where did we learn all this? by treating patients here. We know it's like that, and we know that it's going to happen. Okay, so adherence is indeed, you have to take your pill every day. But we know that you can get treatment fatigue. I mean, we do it. How many of us didn't stop a treatment with one or other drug because I feel better? Why should I keep taking those pills, okay? There are side effects, and that can be different from person to person, but some of those side effects can be quite really challenging. For instance, the first line which is used right now, one of the drugs caused vivid dreams, they say. You could say nightmares. And some people just can't tolerate it, so they're going to stop. And as I said, they feel better, so they feel cured and why should I keep taking the, the spill? 
the access to treatment is very important and one of the main factors is the drug stockouts. And for this I will give you an example of a small country in, uh, in which is within South Africa and which is Lesotho. Lesotho is about the size of Belgium, 2 million inhabitants, 25% are HIV positive. Okay, so Lesotho has been helped quite a lot by PEPFAR, either through CDC or USAID. But in the course of 2016, PEPFAR decided that four, five of the districts that they were supporting in Lesotho, they wouldn't support anymore. So how is this going to be taken care of? That's one aspect. The other aspect is that locally, there are a series of NGOs which are taking care of patients. And you have to kind of have those people working together. Well, forget it. I have worked in the pharmaceutical industry. I taught competition, was there very fierce, but I hadn't seen anything about the NGOs yet. It's unbelievable. When I arrived the first time in, in Lesotho, um, Partners in Health had just kicked out MSF out of the country. So that means that the people who had been working there, and it's, I have nothing against Partners in Health, but the people who had been working there had all the contacts and the network were just gone and replaced by completely new people who needed to do it. So, and there are so many different actors involved. You have, of course, the government, one of the big uh, players in dispensing treatment are the faith-based organizations who are really treating patients. They are doing a great job in Africa, in, all con in, uh, in, in different countries. And then you have the NGOs and then you have whatever. It's really a nightmare. And this is something, and those are all people who are collecting data. And where does that data go? Big question mark. Okay, so other um, limitations are this the distance to the pharmacy and the frequency of refills, for instance. If I have to go every month to collect my pills at the pharmacy, which is one day away from my home, I'm going to lose two days a month to get my pills. But while I'm getting them, I have no revenue because I can't work. Okay. Um, the stigma is also a very important uh, factor. If someone sees me walking into an HIV clinic, he's got AIDS. And I don't want people to know that. So how do I do that? And then, of course, the fake information and the spread of urban or rural legends which lead to denial. For instance, one of the main legends in Africa is that if I have, as a male, have sexual intercourse with a virgin, then I will be cured from my, vir from my virus. Okay? And that keeps, that is kept alive. And again, we know here that there are also urban legends and when I talk to teenagers about HIV AIDS, it's incredible what I hear about how it is spread and those legends still live. So it's not proper to Africa, but it's, it's a fact. We have to take that into account. And then last and not least, the access to information, the education level. And when you see 50 patients a day, how much time is left to give them the proper information? There are no or very little human resources. There are almost no physicians, so it all falls back on the nurses. But the nurses can't do everything, so it falls back on community workers, which means that the information and the proper and correct information has to be spread. Who's doing that? So that's... Th those are all when I so when we say adherence, okay, we tend to say, okay, the guy didn't take his pills, he is the culprit. It's not true, 
there are a lot of factors that can be taken into account to explain why a patient didn't get the pills. Okay, so finally, um, when we, when I was still working and at Janssen and when we launched this project, those were the parameters that we listed as possible sources to model. Okay, there are some which are very obvious and which can be accessed quite readily. Uh, here, about half of those dropped from the slide. I don't know what happened. <laughs> But there are a lot of statistics which are uh, published yearly by um, UNAIDS. Um, the healthcare system, there are some data that can be found. Resistance studies, that's where there is very, very, very little, especially for Africa, uh, because, as I said, resistance testing is just not done. Who is sitting on a lot of data? WHO. But to access data, WHO is sitting on, I don't know if anyone ever, ever succeeded so far. It's very difficult. And then there is another possibility, are the forecasts for the uh, antiretrovirals or for the viral load tests, consumption and so on, which should be accessed as well. Um, and that's, uh, yes, I think that's about what I wanted to share with you. So any questions? Um, yeah, just a question. Um, the medicines, the drugs, usually are given at the pharmacy. Are they given uh, by uh, 10 pills in a tablet or is it, uh, how does it go usually? Uh, usually, uh, when the patient is starting, he, uh, he or she has to come back every month. And then when the physician or the treating uh, people see that the, uh, the person is compliant and takes the pills, then those that can be for longer. But the longest you have is six months. So there is no um, specific uh, standard? Um, no, uh, but it also depends on the stocks you have. Okay. okay. That's, uh, th those pharmacies are, uh, when you look at the hospital pharmacies, you have 90% is antiretrovirals and the rest is for other, med other indications. Okay, so there is no treatment where you give, for instance, um, only for one month of... Um, uh, taking various pills. I mean, you know, from a medication point of view. I mean, uh, no, no, it's every day. It's no, no. But I mean, um, if you get your medicines, your yes. drugs, um, usually uh, when you get an ordonnance, um, mm -hmm. you can a say prescription, yes, prescription. Um, usually, you have it for for a standard amount of time or pills. Is it usually for one month, or so you have to? Uh well, uh, as I said, it depends. In okay. the in the beginning, you have to go every month, and then. Once you are doing well, you can go less frequently and get more at the same time. Okay, and usually the treatment is free. So if it's known that the, the adherence is often due to a lack or, or the difficulty to get the medicine, why not from the start give the six months, for example? Because it would, uh, the question is, why don't you give for six months from day one? Because you want to see the patient again to make sure that the patient takes the pills. So you, you want him at least in the beginning to see the patient more frequently. Because you do not do viral load, you want to monitor something at least. And that's why you ask the patient to come more frequently. But now, when pa patients have been on, on treatment for quite some time, they can come less frequently or they can also, and that's what is observed, uh, some patients form a group, a community, and then one of them goes and picks the drugs for the, the group and they go each in turn so they don't have to go every month or every two months. But it also depends on the logistics. I mean, the country needs to have enough stock to give for everyone six months of pills. That's also 
a uh, logistics issue. <laughs> um, no, just a quick question in any case. I'm not at all an expert about all of this. Um, just I would like to, to know a little bit more about the quality of the statistics about the HIV infection in Africa. Because, for instance, naively, I expected that uh, everybody is diagnosed to have HIV because a blood sample is taken and so on. What I was told, I don't know if it is reliable or not, is that in many cases, the infection is rather inferred because you have, a, for instance, a young person who has a certain kind of infection similar to the parasitic infection, and therefore you tend to believe that that person may have HIV. But it's not that every time you have the smoke, let's say the smoking gun of a blood test. So I don't know if that is true or is this true for some countries and so on. Just a curiosity. Uh, no, th well, um, there are two parts in your question. Indeed, um, first of all, to diagnose HIV, you don't need a blood test. You can do it with saliva. That's very easy. And that is what is happening right now, is that because treatment can be also um, prevention, the countries have decided that they would massively try to detect the HIV patients and get them on treatment. So there are now massive campaigns where people have to go and get regularly detected. Okay? And once a test, a first test, the test takes 10 to 15 minutes. Okay? And then if the test is positive, then there is a confirmation test. And if that confirmation is positive, then the patient is started on treatment as soon as possible. Indeed, to avoid that the detection has to be done by diagnosing AIDS, by having those opportunistic infections, which are a clear sign that there is an infection with the virus. Malefic um, um, I'm not the expert on that. I, I, I suppose like for antibiotics, there must be a parallel market with those drugs, and there must be unfortunately fake. Some maybe you know more about that. No No, I, I don't know, but I'm sure there are some fake, and there are also some. Uh, beliefs that if you take some plants and things like that, you will be treated efficiently as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.